This is your host, Rabbi Etan Levy. Welcome to the Jewish Geography Podcast. If you are a longtime subscriber to the podcast, you might want to know that I've also started doing these as videos. I'm not quite sure yet what's going to be on videos and what's going to be on podcast, but if you go to rabbiaton.com and you click a little button to subscribe, you will get all updates ongoing for everything I'm putting out as they come out. So today, we're going to be talking about Holocaust Memorial Day. And basically, I have a friend, a Facebook friend, social media friend, who I've never met in real life, as many of us do. And his name is Thane Rosenbaum. He's, a, I believe, a lawyer in the New York area and a, a teacher at a university there and a really great guy. And basically, he wrote an article for... Uh, Holocaust Memorial Day, which is coming up here in Israel. We keep it according to the Hebrew calendar, not the English calendar. So in case you're confused about why it's happening now, when didn't we just have it, or isn't it later, or whatever, um, in Israel it's coming up on Thursday, Wednesday night this week. So so Thane is a great guy. Uh, he writes a lot of great stuff. Um, and he basically is uh, someone on the Israeli side in the whole lawfare debate, which is basically countering the method that the Palestinian Authority has taken to try to fight the Jewish people by taking us to court. Uh, they, they may have uh, calculated badly based on how many Jewish lawyers there are. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about an article that he wrote, and I'll give a little bit of commentary on it. I don't take this I hope nobody takes this as uh, too harsh on him, especially Thane, which, whose stuff I really appreciate. I do have a little bit of criticism, uh, but it's not really criticism. It's more expanding the perspective involved in it. So Thane starts out his article, and he the first line is, you know, when I look up like this, I'm reading off the computer screen, uh, the most unspeakable crime of the 20th century, or for... Uh, or any century for that matter, actually inspired a lot of people to speak about it. So his article, the title is, Is There Anything Left to Say About the Holocaust? And he says, well, you know, people have been saying a lot about it, but I actually want to focus in on something that he says here, just by the way, that calling it the most unspeakable crime of the 20th century, or any century for that matter. And he talks about, he goes on to talk about this, but the question really is, is it so different? Um... Every crime is unique. Uh, if you study, uh, if you're a in the criminal justice system, if you're a lawyer or a judge, you know, I'm sure that you'll see that um, every case is different. The, the exact motivations that a person has are different. What the situation they were in in their life is different from person to person, from situation to situation, from case to case. But nonetheless, there are certain universals that follow through and and Thane does get to that uh, but I don't think I wouldn't even go so far as to say that this is the worst crime uh, the most unspeakable crime um, it's probably maybe bigger than others because they had modern technology the Nazis had modern technology at their fingertips uh, but it's not particularly more evil than many other crimes done throughout history uh, including to the Jewish people well, let's let's keep going. He says, The number of Yom HaShoah commemorations has declined around the world. With each passing year, they dwindle, not unlike the number of survivors. Basically, throughout the article, he's talking about how basically people have Holocaust remembrance fatigue. It's not his wording, that's mine, but he describes how you know there were all these movies about it, there are all these classes about it, there are uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day events, laws, etc. And he says that basically these don't seem to be working. And yeah, right? I mean, that might be what you'd expect would happen because this is an event that happened 70 years ago. And right now we're talking about the grandchildren and already great-grandchildren of the people who survived or the people who perpetrated these events who were around making decisions in the world. And that makes sense. But why the real question is why is it important to remember it 
I think the, the if you just looked at it objectively, this is a huge crime committed by a group of human beings against another. Um, the communists, they killed lots of people, uh, maybe 20 million in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union alone. The Chinese communists killed millions of people. If you go back in American history long enough, millions of Native Americans, many people throughout history have been wronged, have been killed. Uh, not that I would necessarily put the American uh, against the Native Americans in the same basket because it was so long ago, and I don't want to judge people by our modern standards, but, you know, uh, I think what's really different, really the difference with the Nazi genocide is that it happened in a time that's modern enough that we can really identify with the people. And that's important. But it's also important to always note that people don't change. Humanity doesn't change. Uh, he talks about, he goes on to talk about how, you know, anti-Semitism is resurgent uh, in Europe in particular. And he mentions, uh, for instance, uh, an elderly Holocaust survivor who was recently stabbed and burned to death by a Muslim man. Uh, and a and as well as a a young man who was tortured and killed uh, also by Muslims in uh, in France several years ago. Uh, he sort of acknowledges this aspect of it, but he doesn't really... Well, let's see. He says, Each of these crimes was committed by Muslims, excuse me, on a, com on a continent already soaked with Jewish blood. Who would have guessed that the Middle East crisis would follow the Jews to Europe, where they were still trying to rebuild their lives second day, seven decades after Auschwitz? I'll keep, I'll keep reading. It says, all around the world, even throughout the United States, the grand experiment of Holocaust memory appears to have failed. Museums and memorials, although still well attended, are perceived as depressing amusement rides with statistics about mass murder artifacts from concentration camps and an occasional cattle car just to complete the necessary real feel you are there experience. After departing from such places of ephemeral horror, visitors emerge into the light and settle upon where to have lunch. Their confrontation with Holocaust memory lasts as long as Chinese food traveling through a digestive tract. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Jews are clearly at a new phase for Holocaust memory, from the destruction of the temples, the Spanish Inquisition, pogroms in the Pale of Settlement, and murderous mayhem everywhere else, all capped by the Holocaust. Welcome to its latest iteration, call it Jew Hatred 4.0. Uh, so that, I feel like he's getting closer to the heart of the matter. It's Jew Hatred 4.0. It's an updated version, but it's an old program. What did we think was going to happen, he continues. As long as there is anti-Semitism in the world, there will always be something to say about the Holocaust. They are, they are symbiotic and codependent. The only thing that could ever make the Holocaust disappear is the end of anti-Semitism itself. Good luck with that. So Thane, I, I think he really makes a good argument for the fact that Holocaust education is important and it's necessary, uh, and also that it doesn't seem to be working, uh, and that it's a necessary counterpoint to anti-Semitism, which is ongoing. Uh, I think what he really misses, though, is that the anti-Semitism that caused the Holocaust is just the latest iteration of ancient Jew hatred. Uh, one of my my favorite, and I, favorite seems like a strange word to use, but probably the best book I've read on this subject is Anti-Judaism. And it's a great book because it describes this tradition of hating Jews, which has been ongoing in the Western world, and I mean, including the Arab and Muslim worlds in that, for thousands of years. It's nothing new. It's been from the from ancient Egypt until our times. And what's essentially happened is that the Muslim world, especially the Middle Eastern Muslim world, just imported Nazi anti-Semitism directly, and now they're you know, bringing it back to Europe, and a lot of Europeans are perfectly happy to uh, accept the Muslims as, you know, a persecuted minority, especially if that means that they can go back to hating Jews again, which they never really stop doing. It sort of uh, gives people a little bit of a rationale to go back to what they really want to do, which is natural. It's what we all do. So then it gets us to the next question. Why is it? Why do people hate the Jews so much? You know, they're all different reasons, right? Uh, you know, the, the reasons why the ancient peoples, like the 
uh, like the Egyptians and Greeks and Romans hated the Jews had to do with their monotheism and their iconoclasm, you know, their smashing of idols, which in those days really meant something because they had idols. Um, and with the Christian church throughout the end of the classical and the Middle Ages, it was because they were, you know, God killers, essentially. They were deicides who had killed Jesus, which, again, it's though technically maybe accurate, something you could read in the Gospels. It's certainly not a way that one has to read the Gospels. And uh, thanks to more modern interpretations uh, that many Christians, including the Catholic Church, have made, it's no longer the mainstream way for Christians to read it, at least in the West. And then it passed into modern anti-Semitism, which was about everything. <laughs> Basically, the Jew was just so seen as the representative of everything that is bad and evil in the world that whatever you don't want, you just put it on the Jews. And it continues until today. So I want to put it a little bit differently. You know, on Passover, which just passed recently... We read that in every generation, God will send people to try to destroy us, and he will save us from their hand. Well, obviously, God is sending them also. He's not only delivering us from their hand, he's also sending them. And delivering us from their hand is not always as great as it sounds, right? That might come after a great catastrophe and millions of people dead, six million people in the case of the Holocaust. But if you see the need for the Jewish people to fight against enemies of God and the mission of the Jewish people to bring monotheism and the consciousness of God into the world, if you see this as something that's woven in to the fabric of the universe, something like the Holocaust becomes a lot more explicable. Uh, and explaining something doesn't excuse it, right? Uh, in fact, in this case, the opposite. We're explaining that the Holocaust happened because people have both good and evil in them, and it's not so unusual for people to choose evil. You know, I think uh, both sort of a simplistic, an overly simplistic view that some Christians hold uh, that, you know, human nature is essentially evil uh, and also a overly simplistic view that many humanists hold that human nature is essentially good, which it's kind of self-defining because they define whatever human beings think as good, uh, as the definition of humanism, uh, in a sense. But both of those are simplistic to the sense of nonsense, and really we all know, each one of us knows that in the human heart, uh, of which we each have one, that there's an ongoing battle between good and evil. And we are never more than one generation at the very most away from the complete erasure of our values and everything we believe in. No battle is ever won in perpetuity. And one thing that God's promise to the Jewish people tells us is that in every generation they're going to come and try to destroy us, but he will save us from them. And that tells us that the struggle will go on. But of course the struggle will go on. Life is a struggle. This world is about dealing with things, many of which are very difficult. The issue is that the Jewish people continue to exist to fight that fight. That's the real guarantee there. Of course they'll come and they'll try to destroy you. They're going to try and destroy anything good. Everybody, anything in the world that's good, someone will come along and try to destroy it. The Jews are that indestructible element, that indestructible diamond at the core of existence that cannot be destroyed, and therefore will always be a bone in the throat of evil. And there will always be evil until until the end of days, until the, the nature of the world as we know it is changed through miraculous means. There will always be people who choose to take an evil path. But 
you know, a lot of people want to say there's this resurge of anti-Semitism, but I think anyone that thinks that there's an overall worldwide resurgence and resurgence in anti-Semitism is zoomed in a little bit too much on their own societies. Most of the world feels exactly the same about Jews as they have the entire time. That is, uh, the Middle East uh, and much of the Muslim world still hates us, just like they always did. They imported it straight from the Nazis, uh, Nazi um, racial anti-Semitism, and adopted that view of Jews largely in their societies and mixed it in with sort of classical religious anti-Semitism of the Islamic variety. And today we have a monster hybrid of the two, but essentially it's the same tradition of hating Jews that continues from long, long into the past. Uh, Eastern Asia, they couldn't care less. They're not anti-Semitic for the most part or pro-Semitic. They don't know what Jews are and they don't care. And the West, they never really stopped hating us to start with. So everything's the same. Everything's the same. But when we look at the last 70 years, we see that God, for some reason that we don't really understand or don't understand fully, decided that it was time for us to be delivered from the hands of our enemies, not after they had killed millions and not after they had stood in power over his people, over the Jewish people, but instead to deliver us from their hands by giving us the means to save ourselves, to fight for ourselves in 1948, there was an attempted genocide against the Jewish people. It's not usually seen that way because we talk about it in terms of the war of independence. This is war between two nation states. But one side of that conflict had a stated goal of murdering every ethnic member of the opposite side upon winning the battles. The same is true in 1967 when the Six Day War resulted and in 1973 in the last great attempt to murder all the Jews in the Middle East, which of course, thank God, failed. So genocide against the Jewish people is not something that ever went away. Uh, trying to kill the Jewish people is not something that ever went away. Trying to kill the Jewish people en masse is not something that ever went away, and it's not something that originated uh, in you know the 1930s in Germany, certainly. Uh, we just like to, us modern people, many of us like to forget history before 150 years ago and think that uh, the world was created anew uh, with humanism and the scientific revolution. But really those things are essentially outgrowths of older patterns of thought. And they keep many of the same prejudices and many of the same hatreds. Next week, hopefully, uh, I'm going to have a much more hopeful podcast for you. But one of the brilliant things about the state of Israel, the founders of the state of Israel, and what they did is that they set things up so that we would go all the way down deep into the darkness before we come up for the light. So leading up to next week, to Independence Day, at the end of next week, we dive all the way deep, deep down into the darkness of the Holocaust, and then into the darkness of the sacrifices we had to make to establish a state. And then we flip over into Independence Day, where we celebrate the results of that sacrifice and what it has brought us and all the good that that's done in the world. So on this Holocaust Memorial Day, I think the main message I want to leave you with is one of vigilance, because if you have been on a college campus lately in the United States as a uh, religious looking Jew, you know that you're not terribly welcome uh, and that you will largely be accused of things which a state thousands of miles away of which you're not a citizen most likely uh, is actually responsible and for which in any case uh, the accusations against which are kind of crazy, you if you live in Europe, you will likely have been told not to wear a kippah in public because it's dangerous. And of course, there are no Jews left in most of the Middle East because they were all killed or kicked out in the 1940s and 50s. 
uh, and they keep around little token populations of a few dozen or a few hundred Jews in a lot of these places, just so they can claim they're not anti-Semitic. Like in Tehran, there are still a few hundred Jews around, so they can claim they don't hate us as they plan the next attempted genocide against us, which is to annihilate six million Jews with an atomic bomb. That vigilance needs to be maintained, but again, it's nothing new. It's the same. And what does that vigilance really mean? What does God really want from us? Um, so I don't know, I can't claim to know the exact reasons behind the Holocaust and why God chose to hide his face in that way and allow such evil to happen without intervening. But we certainly have, in our tradition, God did the same thing in Egypt. He let us be slaved and let the Egyptians kill our firstborn males, which is, what is that if not a genocide? Before intervening on our behalf when we cried out. And I think that it seems to me, based on our history since the Holocaust, that our cries were finally heard, that we finally did cry out in one voice, and we're finally deserving of some level of redemption. Not a full redemption, but some level. And next week, please God, we'll talk about that more in depth. In the meantime, I hope you have a meaningful Remembrance Day. I recommend you go on the Yad Vashem website, Y-A-D-V-A-S-H-E-M. That's the Israeli Holocaust Memorial. And they have some really interesting um, picture exhibits uh, online that you can see, including one about, uh, it's mostly about women, but one of them is about women of faith and how their faith helped them and, and how they dealt with it during and after the Holocaust, which I thought was particularly um, touching. So I really recommend you go take a look at that. And uh, on Thursday, uh, you know, in Israel, we'll have a siren sound and everybody will stand. And if you don't live in Israel, which I imagine, uh, actually, I know that most of my listeners don't, uh, you know, take a few minutes and uh, maybe stand in honor and in silence of not only the six million who were killed, but of all those who have been killed throughout the centuries, sanctifying God's name uh, as part of the Jewish people, as part of this nation, which represents something in the world, something about holiness, something about awareness and consciousness, and bringing them into the world, which there will always be people who don't want to hear. So with that, I'm going to leave you. Thanks for watching or listening. You can email me at atan at rabbiatan.com uh, with any questions, comments, concerns. And if you want to see all the stuff I've got going on, go to Rabbi Atan. That's rabbi with two Bs, right? E-I-T-A-N dot com. You can sign up for the newsletter for me. That way you'll get messages from me more or less weekly, possibly more, uh, with all the stuff I've got going on, videos, podcasts, articles, tours, anything you're interested in, uh, I would love to be in touch with you. And uh, so if you'd like to hear from me regularly, go on there and sign up for the newsletter uh, or just check out the blog where I'll be posting everything. And if you really like the podcast and you want to support me and what I'm doing, what I'm producing here, uh, go to patreon.com slash rabbi And there's a page there where you can give a little monthly donation. We've got a couple of new donations on there the names of which I don't have in front of me right now, but I'm going to uh, include a thank you to the new to the new subscribers uh, in the notes, the show notes, so you should be able to see those wherever you're watching this, watching or, or listening to this. And I want to say thank you to them. It really means a lot. And of course, the more donations I get, the more time I can dedicate to doing this. Uh, I spent some of the money I've gotten over the last few months from subscribers to uh, upgrade equipment, and uh, set aside a little time so that I can start doing videos. So hopefully this comes out well. Please excuse any technical uh, problems, as this is my first attempt with the video. Uh, hopefully I'll get better at performing for the camera. And in the meantime, I hope you have a meaningful Holocaust Memorial Day, a great rest of the week, and I'll see you soon.